Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Uh, happy Sabbath. So today's lesson for this quarter, at least, is three cosmic messages, which we're going to find out more about. And today's specific lesson is Jesus win, Satan loses. I can't wait to get into that one. But before we begin, we need to invite the most important person. That's our Lord. Amen. Mark, could you open us in prayer? Sure. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you for this opportunity to get to know um, your message, this, this awesome message. We're going to learn about symbols. We're going to learn about your love for us. We're going to learn about what you've promised for us. Um, help us to dig into it, um, understand it, internalize it, and make it part of our day as we go here on the Sabbath and for the weeks to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. So let's start off with the quarter, since this is the very first lesson. Three cosmic messages. Let me ask you something. Do you think the world seems like it's in conflict? I'm going to go with yes. In nature, we see animals at odds with each other, praying and eating one another. Even human beings, how often do they get along? Mm. Yes, well, just look at the state of the world, right? Mm. Um, even the weather, it seems like it's going kind of wacky lately. Even in California, we get rain now, which is a good thing. But everywhere else, it's gone a little wackier. Tornadoes, hurricanes, fires, violent paths of destruction. Even in space, we see this. This, this, this corruptible influence. 1994, there was something called the Shoemaker Comet. And it broke apart and it actually hit Jupiter. And it created a dark spot in Jupiter, literally the size of the Earth, about 7,500 7, miles in diameter. Um, it was estimated that it was 6 million megatons in explosive power. So if you take your average nuclear warhead, about 500 kilotons, that's about 12 of those. Far from pleasant and peaceful existence in the world or universe as we see. And why? Where did this raging conflict, all this turmoil come from in the first place? Well, we have something called the Great Controversy. The rebellion of Lucifer, also known as Satan, the dragon, that serpent of old, and the devil. If we look at Revelation, the first three words in Greek are apocalypsis, Jesus, Christos, which literally means the unveiling or revealing of Jesus Christ. There we find the answers for everything we need in the final climatic events of this world. There are specifically three cosmic messages, or as we know, more commonly know them, the three angels' messages, found in Revelation 14. And they are crucial for everyone in this world to hear, especially towards these end times. And tr it truly is a matter of life and death. And I mean that eternal life or death, that is. Within Revelation is the roadmap for the end time events. His last day plans for our trouble planet, and that is his as in God. Natural disasters, pandemics, climate change, wars, and political turmoil. The world's a mess, right? And it only looks like it's going to get worse. Pretty dismal, I know. I paint a sad picture, but thankfully, we have a loving God who reveals the path through these end time events, explaining it throughout all of Revelation, but especially in chapter 14 with the three angels' message. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at two opposing sides, Jesus versus Satan. Not only will we look at the tools that each have at their disposal, but how that affects us in this world here and now. So for Sabbath, today's lesson, Jesus wins and Satan loses. With the title like that, whose team do you want to be on? Jesus. Yes, you do want to pick the winning side, hopefully. So how did all this trouble start? How did it really begin, this mess, this controversy? Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, 
who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And we're going to go more into that actually on, um, on Tuesday's lesson as well, but on Sunday's lesson. And we're going to have a lot of verses repeated, I believe. So, but we see this war in heaven where sin began, where a covering cherub, Lucifer, also known as the dragon and Satan, as we mentioned earlier, not only rebelled against God, but he was ousted for heaven. There was no place found for him any longer there. So what happens? He comes down to the earth. He stole the title as ruler of this world when he convinced Adam and Eve not to trust God, resulting in their rebellion and sin. Because when you relating to God, rebellion and sin are the same thing. Hence, Adam lost his title as ruler of this world to his new master, Satan. This, this is reinforced in Scripture in Job with Satan coming, along, coming to heaven to represent the earth along with the sons of God. With this presence of sin, who did the fallen race naturally follow? Satan. It was built into our DNA. So most of the world today is firmly under his power and control. And we see in Revelation 12, 12, For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. So for, for that small remnant that keeps the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus, Things seem pretty, pretty bleak, don't they? Seems like you have most of the world against you. Which brings us to Revelation 12, 17, the memory verse. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. We know that was during the dark ages, but it is also true today. You say, oh, Christians aren't persecuted today. For 2022, an advocacy group called Open Door states that 360 million Christians experience high levels of persecution and discrimination, and that 5,898, according to their numbers, were killed for their faith in 2022. It seems like it's alive and well. So if you are a Christian who keeps the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, you are outnumbered, outgunned, and seemingly out of luck. But we know that Jesus won the war at the cross. We know that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. We know that the Father has placed all authority. Wait, how much authority? All authority has been placed under his feet. Jesus is now the ruler of this world. But unfortunately, the world has not accepted their new sovereign, their only true king. For those who stand against God's people, they won't be fighting God's people. They will be fighting against God. As Gamaliel said in Acts 5, 38 and 39, So in the present case I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan is of an or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. Don't mess with God, was his counsel. Because when you fight against God, there is only one thing that can happen. You lose. Yes. And whoever it is, you lose when you fight <laughs> against him. So... This week, we will focus on the great controversy between good and evil down through the centuries and these four points. Satan's rebellion in heaven, his attempt to kill the baby Jesus, and really throughout his entire life, but especially at that point. Satan's attack on God's people during the dark ages, and his final attack on God's remnant people in the last days. So, Mark, can you tell us about Sunday's lesson, The Battle in Heaven? Yes, I can. But first, I wanted a little talk about, you know, I like stories where um, I kind of know, expect the ending. 
I kind of know it. Like, you know, I like uh, action movies, you know, because I kind of know that at the end it's going to be a good movie, it's going to end well. I don't like uh, bad endings. I like happy endings. This is the way to go about it. We're going to read in here, and re we've talked in Revelations, as you're talking about ultimately what the ending is. And right. we know it. Amazingly, we know yeah. it. It's awesome. If he's got it nailed in the past and it's come true, why wouldn't you trust him for the future? That's right. But we're going to learn about a battle in heaven that did happen in the past. And let's talk about this. And before we start that, though, um, this idea of, I wanted to bring up this idea of love and this ability to love one another. And the, the question is, doesn't it need the ability of free will? Love cannot be forced. It cannot be coerced. We can't be forced to love God. We need to come to our God of our own free will. And so God, what did he do? At the very beginning, he gave free will to Adam. And through extension, Eve. Let's read about Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17, where he presented this free will. The Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to, to tend to it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may free, freely eat. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God gave man free will. And we know what happened. The deceiver to help affected that. And so as, as Byron was saying, Adam lost, uh, his, lost the leadership to Satan. But he also gave free to heavenly beings. At one time, believe it or not, Satan was like Adam, sinless, he wasn't in Eden, he was in heaven. And we read about this as at least a reference to this in Isaiah, in the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15, although you may not see the, you may only have 13 to 15 up there. How have you, how, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Talking, Isaiah talking about how Lucifer went down and was brought down to earth. So he gave man free will. He gave Satan free will. Who else did he give free will? Well, yes, he did us. He also gave Jesus free will, didn't he? Jesus was free to choose whatever he did, but what he did was he chose to save us. He, he loved us so much that he sacrificed themselves for our sins. And we know that when we, when this, at the end times, when we have the creation of the second coming, he's going to come again at that time. But in, we're going to read in Revelation 7, 9, uh, 7 through 9, Byron already mentioned it, we're going to read about a battle in heaven that already occurred and dig into this a little bit more in detail. But before I do that, I want to start with Revelation 4 and 5 first to give us a little bit of background, and then we're going to dig into Revelation 7 and 9 and dig into the details of this. Revelation 4. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it, was, as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and the throne. And in Revelations 12, verses 7, the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, and they did not prevail nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. And the dragon was cast out, and that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, and he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So we're going to let's unpack these symbols. First of all, when did, this, like, when did this battle occur? This battle occurred after Jesus ascended to heaven. And we read that because in Revelation 5, it talks about how she bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with rod and iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Jesus ascended to heaven. In fact, the other thing is, is that how do we know this war, who was in this war? What is this Michael person? The name of Michael means in Hebrew, he who is like God. Elsewhere, 
It really means Jesus. Elsewhere in the Bible, he is known as the chief priest. In Daniel 12, verses 1, it says this. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. So we know what Michael is. Michael's Jesus. Now let's talk about who the, devil, uh, who the dragon is. And that's clear because it shows it in the text. It says the da- devil is, the dragon was Satan or the devil. And who are the angels with the dragon? Those are the, the followers of the devil. His tail, in Revelation 4, we, we read about that earlier. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And they stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So why was Satan thrown out of heaven this time? Why? I mean, wasn't he already in Eden? Wasn't he already thrown out before? And the idea is no, actually, he wasn't. He did have access to heaven. He was a serpent. He he had been cast out, um, and he was in Eden with Adam and Eve at the time. But in Job 1, 6 and 7, Byron actually mentioned this too, we see where he is conversing with in accordance also with angels. Let's read about this. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, where do you come from? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth. The sons of God in this text represent the divine assembly of angels and in God's presence in heaven. In short, every battle Satan has with God, he loses. The battle before Eden and when the stars were swept from the sky. The battle after the cross when Jesus fights Satan. And we hear later lessons about the second coming of Jesus Christ. All we have to do is choose Jesus. And his love for us will be felt. Simply, I'll finish up with Luke 11, 23, there's just two choices. Whether whoever is not with me is against me, whoever does not gather with me scatters. Thank you. And I just want to throw in one extra thing. Um, you know Michael is Jesus because in Joshua 5, 13 through 15, when Joshua comes by Jericho and he lifts up his eyes and he looks and behold, there's a man standing opposite with the sword drawn. And Joshua goes to him and says, are you for us or for our adversaries? He says, no, rather, I indeed have come as captain, and that word can be a prince Mm -hmm. or a commander as well, of the Lord, of the host of the Lord, so the angels of the Lord. And then Joshua worships him. And so angels don't take worship. So you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, it is Jesus. Amen. So Danielle, Monday, Satan's attack. It's like continuation of the lesson. We're also <laughs> oh. covering along that. So yeah. I'm going to expound on that. Satan's attack. Um, I mean, we start, when, when did his attack really start? We started with a perfect world, Adam and Eve, in a perfect garden. Mm-hmm. I mean, perfect setup. And yet, here we see the devil in the form of a serpent coming in. And his attempt is at separating the human race from God. He's the creator, and he succeeds. So the first attempt, he seems triumphant. He, he succeeded that. And then we know as you follow that, uh, you know, that he is no longer really welcomed in heaven, but he cannot be barred yet yeah. until Jesus actually is sacrificed on the cross. And then only after that can they actually, he can be barred from heaven, as uh, uh, Mark has just explained. But after that, as we're looking at this lesson, and the lesson, if you've looked at it this week, it's really pointing out all the attempts and how he has failed. Uh, It's like we're starting with Christ's birth when he tries to have Jesus killed. And, you know, with the angel, the Lord sends a message and sends the parents with Christ to Egypt uh, to escape. But we know the effect is that all the two-year-old and, and below male children in Israel die as a result of that. They call it the slaughter of the innocent. Right, the slaughter of the innocent. So that was a, an, a significant attempt. 
And then in the wilderness, we know when Jesus is in the wilderness, he's getting tempted and he is uh, deflecting that attempt clearly and strongly as only Christ can with an it is written, but we can too follow his example. And then we see on the cross and leading up to the cross, I mean, it must have been extremely difficult for Jesus to stay while he's being taunted, but yet stay he did on our behalf on the cross and on that path of suffering. And then uh, we just continue to, to see his attempt at if he did not succeed, then to, to, to destroy Christ and stop Christ in his work, then he's trying to separate his church now from the believers. And in Revelation, we see that. So really, that's why we're looking in this first lesson of the quarter. We are setting up a background as we're going to look at the three angels' message and before as we prepare. So I would like to, stay, to, to start by uh, looking at Genesis 3.15 as Jesus announced the plan of salvation. So in Genesis 3.15, he announces, and he says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So here's the introduction of the plan of salvation right after the fall of Adam and Eve. And here starts the journey that we're on, and the whole world is on, and, uh, and God as his attempt of salvation. So then we, let's start reading Revelation. And I'm just going to go as fast as I can from Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So here we go. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And we already know from our studies that the woman is really the church. And as described here, she is the poor woman. Pure, pure woman, not the apostate woman. So it is the church, and Christ is about to be born. So he is about to, the Messiah that was promised to Adam and Eve in the beginning, he is about to enter this world to come on his mission. And the church is the right place to be described in Revelation that he's coming out of, because that's where he's coming, to be with his people and to save his people. The other thing we see this woman as is described that she's got a crown and the crown is as we've studied before it's not the diadem it's not the crown of of uh, a king but it's the stephanos which is the crown of the victor so this woman the church has a victory crown on her head as christ is about to be born so that's also a very important sign and then we continue uh, we've already read, Mark has already covered how, he, you know, and when we continue in the verses afterwards, um, in Revelation 12, chapter 3 and 4, and another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery dragon having seven hands and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Just a quick pause. He doesn't have a Stephanos crown like the woman. He has a power like a kingly kind of crown on his ruler, uh, crown on his head, as because he is the ruler of this fallen world. So, and his tail drew a third of the stars of the heaven and drew them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as he was born. And boy, is that accurate. I mean, he was standing there to catch him and destroy him as he was born. That's why they had to flee to Egypt. And then he was standing there to try to, at the beginning of his ministry, to destroy his, him by a wrong move. And then he was standing there at the cross trying to destroy that work as well. But he did not succeed. And, you know, one of the things that we're looking in, in um, Daniel 8 to 25, it's also destroying... It's, it's representing and explaining to us the same idea. In Daniel 8, 25, it says, Through his cunning, he shall cause this seed to prosper under his rule, talking about Satan, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, in other words, Jesus, but he shall be broken without human means. God will destroy them. And then continuing in Revelation 
chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, we see that the woman, uh, she gives birth to the child, which is Jesus. She bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now, we're not going to take the time to review this, but in there was a period in church history when the church was protected in a wilderness. What appeared at the Dark Ages also served the purpose of protecting some of the believers. And we know that the Waldensians were hiding at those periods of time. A lot of the potential martyrs, and some that were martyred, they were hiding and some escaped. So there was always a remnant prepared and protected even through the Dark Ages. But what is this thing about the rod, you know, a child, Jesus, to rule all nations with a rod of iron? So I have a reference in Psalm 20, chapter 2, verses 1 to 9, and it's about the Messiah's triumph and kingdom. Uh, and in Psalms it said, why do the nations range and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision and cast away their cords from us. And when, as I jump down, it actually uses the same rod of iron in verse 8. It says, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So we can see that it's like complete. These words that are being used in Revelation chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, are denoting Christ's complete, complete, successful um, victory. Yeah. Victory. Nobody stands against the scepter of iron. Right. And then, continuing, we're going to Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 9. And we know Satan's thrown out of heaven. Mark already covered that a little bit, but I'm going to read verse 9 as well. So, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil, and Satan who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So we can see he's made repeated attempts as we looked at through this lesson. And even when we look through Revelation, we can see his attempt, attempts. But as we look through our past studies and through the text in, in the Bible, we can see all his attempts, but they all come down to naught. He was successful once with Adam and Eve, but thereafter, well, he's also, he's also successful in our lives many times when we choose him, but if we choose God, he's not successful. Uh, I won't read the text. There were additional texts that prove in the Bible that Michael is actually Jesus, but we'll leave it at that because we had quite a bit of evidence there, and there's more than that in the Bible. Um, so I'd like to close by reading in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 and 12. This is Paul writing the Philippian church, and it's a message to us because when we're looking at this battle cosmic battle that we are also involved in what's the word to us but what things were gained to me apostle paul says these i have counted lost for christ yet indeed i also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of christ jesus my lord for whom i have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that i may gain christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attend to the resurrection from the dead. Now that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that's what we must do, press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Amen. Thank you. And I love what you said about Jesus against the devil in the wilderness too. So in Ephesians 6, it says the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That word word is actually a rima, the spoken word. So you see Jesus using scripture and speaking it to Satan right. to rebuke him. Right. I love that. <clears throat> so Tuesday's lesson, accepting Jesus's victory.
So we've seen how Satan literally, his rebellion in heaven, right? Against Michael, which we know was Jesus. How did that come out? Loser. We see the attempt to kill Jesus as an infant resulted in failure, which you saw. We see Satan's attempt to wipe out God's people and the past, and we'll see it in the future. In the past, he failed. As you mentioned, Danielle, there's always been a remnant. And in the future, we know he will fail again <clears throat> because God says so, and he's never been wrong so far. Um, we can see in the last days, our, we can see in the last days there will be trials and tribulations, but um, even, even with all that he will do, even with the winds of strife being pulled back or, restri or not restrained so much, and Satan will have the most power he'll ever have, we still see God will have a remnant. So I look at this, even when Jesus lived on this earth, and we talked about the temptation in the wilderness, the garden of Gethsemane, where he overcame and was obedient to the Father. Jesus' entire life on this earth was one long overcoming of the devil, all the way to the cross, and there it was finished, and the victory was won forever. And we know that after that point, the Christ became the ruler of this world once again, although the final conflict was not over yet. We know Jesus wins. The only real question is, how many casualties will there be along the way? So, Revelation 12, 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God and of the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. So if we accept Jesus, and he's with us, and he's abiding with us, what kind of power does that really give us? Or actually, does he have to intercede? We look at that word for thrown down, and the Greek word is belo, which means thrown. But it's not just like a push or a shove. It's literally you're grabbed and launched or as like a projectile. So Satan just wasn't pushed or anything like that. Jesus manhandled him, overpowered him, and threw him down hard. That is the victory that Christ has over Satan. And that's the victory that he can give each one of us. I like that. Revelation 3.21, he who overcomes, I will grant to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down on my father or with my father on his throne. It's about overcoming. Jesus is an overcomer and which is part of his victory. So now you may wonder how can I be an overcomer for that victory in Christ as well? And we're going to look at Revelation 12, 11. And they that overcame him, that Satan, because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. So the word overcame in Greek is nikeo, which means to conquer to prevail, to triumph, and to come through victoriously. God's people are able to overcome because of the blood of the Lamb. How often do we see the Lamb in Revelation? How important is it? Where would we be without Christ's sacrifice? Still dead in our sins? Unforgiven? Lost? Jesus led the perfect life on this earth, so we don't have to. And that said, we also cannot do it alone. And just believing doesn't cut it. He, that is Christ Jesus, has to be with you. How is he going to fight for you? How is he going to give you that victory if he's not present? He will overcome for you when he abides and dwells in you. And you cling and hold fast to him. In Revelation 5, we see the book of the seven seals. And the question is asked, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? 
And no one in heaven or on earth is worthy except the Lamb. That's how important the Lamb is. Revelation 5, 6. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. We're not going to go into all the symbology, but sent out into all the earth. Jesus overcame all the accusations of the devil because he is an accuser, right? We read that earlier. He lived the perfect life of obedience to the Father in heaven. Wow, can we do that? Not even close without him, right? So, and when we accept by faith what Jesus has done for us through his sacrifice and our repenting, number one, our guilt is gone. Number two, our sins are forgiven. Number three, we are no longer condemned for our transgressions. They're taken away. Number four, Jesus bears the guilt, the shame, and the condemnation for our sins. We saw that at, before the cross even. It was all done at the cross. And can we say thank you, Lord? Because without it, we're done. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he, had, he, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Can we have that now? Can we have that slice of the kingdom of God here on earth? The answer is yes. If you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you possess that. We have been raised with Jesus. He covers us in his righteousness, and we were made perfect in him. Although remember that lamb that was slain, right? What else is Jesus called? He's also called the Lion of Judah. Not so timid, is it? James 2.19 says, You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Other versions say tremble. That's with fear. They are scared to death of Jesus, the overcomer. They know their time is short, and they know that he's already won. So when he shows up, the battle is really over. Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, page 130 and 131, So we may resist temptation and force Satan to depart from us, Jesus gained the victory through submission and faith in God. And by the apostle, he says to us, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Or near, really. James 4, 7, and 8. We cannot save ourselves from the tempter's power. He has conquered humanity. We know the world even though Jesus won it back, they still serve him. And when we try to stand in our own strength, we shall become a prey to his devices. But the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Proverbs 18.10 Satan trembles and flees before the weakest soul who finds refuge in that mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Mark, can you tell us about the woman in the wilderness? Yep, we've, we've we already read about her already. She was in Revelation 12, 6 and 3 and 4. And we're going to dig into Revelations 12, verses 14 and 16 too. Really what we're going to find is that God shows his love by protecting us during times of persecution um, yeah. over and over. And we're going to be able to, what can we use that knowledge to help us moving forward? Let's read. I wanted to start out with um, this, this promise from one of the promises from God in Deuteronomy 31, verses 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. 
And with that said, we're going to read in Revelations 12.6 about the woman in the wilderness. And we've already read it a couple times, but let's dig back into it. And it said, Revelations 12, verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And as Danielle mentioned, this woman represents the true believers of Christ, the true believers in the commandments. What does this 1,260 days mean? We hear this again, um, if we didn't understand it, we hear reference to not exactly those days, but another way we're going to read about the woman in Revelations 12, verses 14. The woman was given two wings of the great eagle, so she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. She, where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and a half, uh, uh, no, times and half a time out of the servant's reach. And so with this idea of 1,260 days and this idea of time, times, and, and a half a time is actually also referred to in Daniel 7.25. Daniel 7.25, let's read that. He who speak who, he will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and laws, and the holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. So this time where the woman's in the desert is referenced already in Daniel 7.25, but let's look at the number. Let's read these symbols. Because it's symbolic, because it's a symbolic understanding, we can take one of the principles of the Bible and that we we can replace a day, but with a year. And so in Numbers, this is coming out of Numbers 14, uh, verses 34, according to the number of the days in which you have spied, and this, is, this came out of when the, the, the 12 spies went into the promised land, and they looked, and they were in the promised land, they were spying out for about 40 days, and they came out, and they didn't trust in the Lord, and so the Lord had to, had to uh, you know, gave them a, a penance of 40 years instead. So let's read about this. It says, according to the days in which they, you spied out in the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty years, and you shall be and you shall know my rejection. So this one thousand two hundred and sixty days is really one thousand two hundred and sixty years. We reference Andrew's study Bible, it states the following. Historicist interpreters, therefore, have generally understood the period of one thousand two hundred and sixty prophetic days to mean Literal 1,260 literal years running from A.D. 538 to 1798, as Daniel mentioned earlier, earlier, before. This is a period where a corrupt church, together with a corrupt state, oppressed, persecuted, and at times slaughtered God's faithful people. Those are the people that are represented by the woman in the wilderness. And real quick. Time sure. is one year, yeah. times is two year, and half a time is half a year. So if you look at the lunar months that the Jews had, there were 360 days in a year. So 360 times three and a half years, or 3.5, comes out to 1260. Yeah. Hmm. So cool. it, yeah. scripture matches up, yeah. it just yeah. says it differently. Exactly. Okay, let's continue on. In Revelations 12:15. We're going to read a few more symbolic, we're going to read 15 and 16 to finish out this today's lesson, A Woman in the Wilderness. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and swept her away with her torrent. So this has some more symbols in this. And if we read in uh, Renko Stefanovic's Plain Revelations, it says the torrent of water from the serpent's mouth is reminiscent of the serpent's deceptive works in the Garden of Eden. This, he's the great deceiver, and, and he's been deceiving way back. We started out in the Garden even uh, Daniel mentioned it, you know, and, and we know this, this, this serpent that's there, and Eden, and, and Adam, but he's been trying to deceive us ever since. In the same manner, and we're going to continue on with Renko, what Renko Stavanovich says. It says, in the same manner, Satan is trying to destroy God's people with a flood of false teachings. In the Old Testament, a flood of waters often used as a symbol of the enemies of God's people attacking and destroying them. As one example, just kind of one example of this, in Psalm 69, verses 1 and 2, it talks about a flood. This is a psalm of David, and David's saying, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. 
I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. Let's read on in, uh, in Revelation 12, verses 16. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. The woman has received a savior or helped out. It wasn't a savior, but it was someone that helped. And we can symbolically interpret that this earth represents, well, North America. And we know this is at the end of that period, 1798, um, we know that people came here to North America and, to be uh, helped out from religious persecution. It doesn't last forever, and we're going to dig further into the details of what happens here in Revelations 13 in another lesson. What can we learn from this? God will never leave us. You know, this woman in the desert, is, I mean, the woman in the wilderness is one, uh, one example. Will never leave us, even in the toughest of times. Like the believers during the Middle Ages, God's going to be with us to the end of days. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Danielle, we are anxious to hear about God's end time remnant. Huh. Thursday's lesson, uh, as we're looking at the opening of the lesson, our text is reminding us in uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, which we've already read a couple times, but the perspective that the purpose of the devil, I mean, that the devil is really upset. And when we're looking at Revelation 12, 7, it says, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. And then we know that he was thrown out. And what's his purpose? His purpose is to take over. He had, that was his purpose from the beginning. He wanted to be like the most high. Right. And as we're looking in Isaiah chapter, uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14, which is in the Old Testament, it's the prophet Isaiah, and it's talking about the fall of Lucifer, we can kind of get a little bit of glimpse into his mind frame and where who he was. He says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. I mean, he did his deceptive work continuously, and he did have some effect. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side to the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And that is his point and his purpose has been from day one with Adam and Eve. And as the times are continuing through the earth's history, his efforts are intensifying because his time is getting shorter. And thus in Revelation 12:17. It says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman. We can see his anxiety from the description of his demeanor. Enraged with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Christ, of Jesus Christ. So we, when we're looking at enrage, he was wroth. His failure to destroy the church in the wilderness is, 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 is now intensifying his wrath and his attempt of destruction. Um, and he's going to the point of making war. He's an, it's an all-out war, and that's really talking about what's coming for us in the end times. Uh, and with who? The remnant, whoever's left over. He's done his destructive work. There are lots that have already been, have chosen his side, but there is a remnant, and that's the, his point of his attention the remnant. And the word in Greek is the remaining wise, loipoi, uh, and to leave behind. And why? His, 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 his attack is for those that keep the commandments. And I, um, I had this impression as I was preparing for this that I need to review the commandments very quickly because the commandments are the character of God. There's a reason that he is hitting at the commandments, and there's a reason he is hitting at the testimony. So the commandments, when we are looking at them, what do they say in is Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17? And God spoke all these words, saying, so here comes the first commandment, I am the Lord your God, his authority, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, you shall have no other gods before me. Nobody else. You're not going to 
have anybody else. Second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a card image, any, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. So we can see already our allegiance is spelled out very clearly. So if, if the devil makes headway, and he has done through generations as we've studied our Bible, that was exactly his point of attack with the Israelites and where he was most successful. Third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And why? Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Whose day is it? The Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and held it. We can see his authority. On what basis are we to? He is our creator. He is the one that created earth and heaven and everything that is in it. That's why we owe him our allegiance. You can see that was number one on the devil's hit list. Right. We can see. We can see why. Fifth, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. F family relationships, important. Sixth, you shall not murder. Seventh, thou shall not commit adultery. Eighth, you shall not steal. Ninth, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. My goodness, that's important. Mm, that important. That's important as the rest. Tenth, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, and so on and so forth. We can see this is the exact character of God. If he succeeds to destroy any point of these, the image of God in us can no longer be represented. So that's the, the, the reason. Revelation 13, 14, 17 says about the devil, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. That's his express effort, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast, to whom? To him, who was wounded by the sword of and lived. He was granted power to give, so his attempt is just that. And as we read in 16, verse 16, he causes all, both small, great, and rich, and poor, and free, and slave to receive a mark on their hand and on their forehead. So he's successful, except for the remnant, mm -hmm. and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark of the beast on their name. And then we see Revelation 19, 1 to 2. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Amen. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot. We know that harlot. So a woman, we have the pure woman, and then we have the woman that is aligned like the prostate church that is aligned with the devil and deceiving the world who corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has avenged her so we can see very clearly spelled the attempts so just a reminder as we were saying in the dragon in verse 17 which we are where we are right now and the dragon was enraged with the woman he went to make war with the rest of her offsprings who keep the commandments of god and have the testimony of jesus christ what does that mean so I pulled a few texts, four in order, that will help us understand the testimony of Jesus Christ, because we can guess all we, we can on that, but really what the Bible says it means is what's important. So what is this testimony of Jesus? Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments again of God and the faith of Jesus. We have faith in Jesus. We obey. Does that what it mean? possibly one of the aspects, but there's more. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, when John first opened the book, and he's telling us what this book is all about, he says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must surely take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. To all the things that he saw. So bore testimony of Jesus Christ for all the things he saw. 
I'm going to skip to Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, because it spells it out the most clearly. And here it goes. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. He was going to bow down to the angels. I am a fellow servant. So the angel is a fellow servant. And of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. And then there's like definition. If, if we had a Webster dictionary, it's like right here. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So in the end times, in that time when the devil is attacking, there is a spirit of prophecy guiding he, the people and encouraging them just as the Lord had sent them through the ages. With that, I'm ready for final comments. Final comments. Please. Final comments. So now I have <laughs> final comments. Now, really quickly, we have seen the devil attacking through the ages, but we have seen the amazing preparation that God has done throughout the ages as well and how he fought with everything for us as his people. Mm -hmm. And not only that, the clarity with, each, with which he put for us out the fact that those that love him keep his commandments and have the testimony of Christ. And that is what should be in our lives. How do we affect that? Do we affect that by our own power? Ezekiel, which is a text you don't have, but I will read it for you. I've added it last minute. Ezekiel chapter 11, 19 through 20 says, then I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. Amen. So the Lord has made even the provision, which we know through the Holy Spirit, as long as we hold on and do our part. And Ephesians 6.10, do you have that out? Were you going to read it? Um, if do. not, I'll read it. Go ahead. So Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. So this is to the Ephesian church from the Apostle Paul, which applies to us, to one of the churches. We are one of the churches. It says, oh God. Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles mm, of the devil. Mm. How are we going to stand against the wiles of the devil in this oh day and age? God. Putting the entire armor of God. God will help us put it on. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Boy, do we see that when we study Revelation. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the devil, the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, 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 with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, as you mentioned earlier. Right. That word, Rima. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Amen. 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 Mark, your final I thoughts. love Revelations because it, it gives so many references to New Testament, to the Old Testament. We can pull them in. We can see how they apply. It is wonderful. And I love your, the, that uh, last quote you did, the armor of God, you know. Amen. God, I mean, and the, le the two days that I followed that here. Jesus. What? <laughs> that worked for Jesus. It you definitely know, worked for us. God's love for us really gave us free will. And, and in the end, he wants us to choose him. And how do we do that? And one of the ways, of course, is we have to put on that armor of God. That's going to protect us. That's going to protect us because God has won all the battles. And he's going to win all the battles to come. And all we have to do is choose him. Thank you. All right. And I actually came across something. It's not Ellen White for a change. It's actually William Warren Prescott. He was one of the Adventist church pioneers. I have this book. I've never actually gotten the chance to read it yet, but it's from Victory in Christ, page 17 and 18. For a long time, I tried to gain the victory over sin, but I failed. I have since learned the reason, 
instead of doing the part which God expects me to do and which I can do, I was trying to do God's part, which he does not expect me to do and which I cannot do. Primarily, my part is not to win the victory, but to receive the victory which has already been won for me by Jesus Christ. But, you will ask, does not the Bible speak about soldiers and a warfare and a fight? Yes, it certainly does. Are we not told that we must strive to enter in? We surely are. Well, what then? Only this, that we should be sure for what we are fighting and for what we are to strive. Because won't God guide you into the fight? Under his direction, not our own. Christ as a man fought the battle of life and conquered. As my personal representative, he won the victory for me. And so his word to me is, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I can therefore say with deep gratitude, thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. My difficulty was due to this, that I did not give heed to the fact that the victory is a gift, already won, and already to be, and, and ready to be bestowed upon all who are willing to receive it. I assume the responsibility of trying to win what he had already won for me. This led me into failure. This victory is inseparable from Christ himself. And when I learned how to receive Christ as my victory through union with him, that would be that abiding, I entered upon a new experience. I do not mean to say that I have not had any conflicts and that I have not made any mistakes, far from it. But my conflicts have been when influences were brought to bear upon me to induce me to lose my confidence in Christ as my personal Savior and to separate from Him. My mistakes have been made when I have allowed something to come in between me and Him, that's Christ, to prevent me from looking into His blessed face with the look of faith. When I fix my eyes upon the enemy or upon the difficulties, in other words, when we look at the problems, or upon myself and my past failures, I lose heart and fail to receive the victory. Therefore, looking unto Jesus is my motto. Can that be all of our mottos? What could anyone say when we lose our confidence in Christ as our personal Savior, we are separated from Him and we lose that victory. He's won for us. This is such powerful stuff. It's so simple and yet so hard in the world we live in because it's hard because who's our greatest enemy besides the devil? Ourself. And even Ellen White writes, that's the biggest struggle we will ever have. I pray that each one of us will surrender self to Jesus and hold fast to him that we may have victory, that victory that he has already won for us each and every day until the day that we fall asleep in Christ Jesus. That is my prayer and petition for everyone here and everyone watching. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you did it all. Through Christ Jesus, you are the living God. You are our Savior. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Teach us to remember the work is not for us to save ourselves. You have already saved us. You lived as a man. You resisted the devil from birth to death. And you won the victory that I or anyone else could never achieve. Teach us to open our hearts and invite you in. Teach us to embrace you each and every day, Lord, that we have, may have life in you. Your burden is easy. Your yoke is light, Lord. And us, that we might die to self and that we might truly live in Christ Jesus. Lord, as I like to say, 
I want to let you drive and just be the passenger. That we might do your good, good labor and work in this world, Lord, and that we might be the sons and daughters of God that you meant us to be from the very beginning. Lord, you died for everyone. You predestined everyone to come to heaven. We just choose poorly sometimes. Help us, Lord, in our doubt and our moments of trial and those moments when the devil really sticks it to us that we might stand firmly on the rock on you in all things, especially in these last days. We thank you, Lord, for the victory that you give us. And we can claim that promise here and now today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath.